you. It's a pleasure to join you all. It's been really cool to hang out here and participate. Yeah. Ping, ping, ping. <laughs> and participate in the Rails developer meetup. I saw this was a meetup, and this looks a little bit bigger than a meetup to me. <laughs> I've tried to follow along with talks and understand what businesses are like here, what careers are like, what people are facing as they're developing Rails applications. And it's all very familiar to me. It's been exciting to see participate in. So thank you. It's an honor to join you. I'm here to talk about what's new in Rails 6. Uh, you can call me Jeremy, a bit sweat. Uh, I go by he or him. <laughs> I'm in San Diego, California. Flew all the way over here. And I'm on the Rails team and I'm from Basecamp. And I'd like to thank Basecamp too for happily allowing me to come for a week to Japan. One note, my speaking, if I go too fast or if I mumble, let me know. If you go like this, I can slow down. <laughs> because I'll, I'll stop paying attention. I'll start speaking quickly. When I'm paying attention, then my brain is kind of a naive interpreter, and sometimes it needs to pause for garbage collection. <laughs> So first thing, security alert. I don't know if you saw there is a supplement to the CVE that came out, and it was called a file content disclosure. Well, it's a file content disclosure, but it's also a remote code execution. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so we were not happy about this and if you're here and you haven't patched your application yet maybe now is the time if you want to excuse yourself and update for the CVE is the right time to do it so what's new in Rails 6 uh, when we heard from David earlier he gave us a brief overview and he covered really the important points there's two new major frameworks there are a, a couple of highlighted additions, parallel tests, multiple database support, and there are tons of other improvements. And as I was thinking about what would be important to share, the frameworks are interesting and they seem like the most important part, but when I notice what it's like to program in Rails, I'm often seeing the little things that don't quite pop out at you and you wouldn't even notice until you're using Rails and you try to use an older version and it's not there. And these all come from everybody who contributes. There are tiny things that people notice in their own applications, and at some point they decide to file a pull request. And as David alluded to, monkey patching is the beginning of freedom patching, and many pull requests begin as a monkey patch. And people decide over the course of months of development that those monkey patches are worth sharing with everybody, and those turn into Rails features. So I'd also like to give some special attention to why we added new frameworks. It's a moment of risk for the Rails community, and it's also a moment of courage. So first, why not Rails 5.3? And it's a good question. Well, why six? Well, we have an easy answer. We'd like to use new Ruby. <laughs> We'd always like to use newer Ruby. And when we decide which version of Ruby to use, we started as saying Ruby 2.4, because that seemed optimistic. Everybody could upgrade. It would be stable. But then we think, how long is Rails 6 going to be out before we have Rails 7? Rails 7 is our next opportunity to make a major Ruby upgrade. And if that's going to be a year and a half, do we really want to be stuck on Ruby 2.4? Or would we rather be using Ruby 2.7 or Ruby 3? So it's a long time to commit, and we'd always like to stick with the best Ruby has to offer. And so this is what Rails can do as a strong default, because it's not just for Rails, it's for all Rails applications. It sets the tone for what we expect and what programmers can look forward to. You don't need to be bound to the past. Next big change, Webpacker taking over for Sprockets. I'm kind of out of my depth here. When I look at a Webpacker, Webpack configuration file, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. And so I, I watched the talk about using Webpacker and how it's for people who maybe aren't super familiar with Webpack. And talking about eject, 
why would I want to eject from Webpacker? It's saving me. <laughs> but I understand. I think the biggest change is not seeing each JavaScript as a special addition to your application, but instead seeing JavaScript as an equal partner in your application. So there's an app JavaScript folder instead of app JavaScripts. It's singular rather than plural because it's respecting the language's addition to your application. So I'll start going a little bit more quickly. So these are the things that actually change. Webpacker install happens by default now. CoffeeScript is gone. We're using ECMAScript throughout. This is what your application.js looks like in a brand new app. This is the default. Well, this is close to the default. I've installed a couple of things. But you can expect that a new application starts with Webpack already ready to go. And each new framework brings in its JavaScript. This is what we used to see when we generated a scaffold. We generated a little bit of sprinkle JavaScript or coffee script for you. That's gone. Adios. <laughs> this was Rails 5. In production, we compressed assets. That's gone too. We've changed our default to respect that viewing source on the web is an important part of what Rails applications have to offer and what every web application has to offer to new web developers. So we've changed that in Webpacker and in Sprockets. This is part of respecting that I learned how to use the web by viewing source. David learned how to use the web by viewing source. It was the first way that people saw Ajax in, in practice and saw complex web applications start to unfold on the web. The way that you could see how any of this worked was by going and looking at the code. And who was going to share the code? Was Gmail going to share their code or Google Maps? They were sharing an experience, not the code. So we got the happy side effect. And we'd like to pass it on and pay it forward. So this is the default. You can turn it off. Source maps are enabled by default, so we get all the benefits of uglifying code. But we don't have to. I don't know if we can read this. It says, unless you don't care about your JS source leaking, you may want to take a closer look at your webpack config file, DHH. So this was a call out to David on Twitter saying, hey, your, uh, your JavaScript's showing. Do you know that? And in fact, we do know that. So if, if you go to Basecamp, you can see all of our stimulus controllers. You can see exactly how they work. And you can see the original source. You're welcome to take a look anytime. <laughs> and this is, this is where defaults matter, too. Just like encouraging the latest Ruby version, we'd like to encourage this kind of behavior. You don't need to stick with the behavior, but we'd like to encourage it. And ironically, in a follow-up tweet, there was the early discovery of stimulus before it was released because it was available on the web. And what stimulus.js would love to learn how to make error messages as nice as this. So that's what the web can do for us and what we can do for the web. Next big one, I'm going to have trouble with this. Zeitwerk. It's a German word. I, had, I looked it up to pronounce it. And in fact, the author of this library, uh, has a pronunciation at the bottom. There's a long URL. But if you go to the Zeitwerk, Zeitwerk website, you can find the pronunciations. It didn't help me, obviously. But <laughs> um, it roughly translates as time factory. And I don't quite know what to make of that. Uh, Xavier, the author, gave an explanation that I also didn't quite digest. But it has something to do with loading code. Let's just leave it at that. We love autoload. We hate autoload. We love autoload. We hate autoload. Can Ruby make up its mind? Ruby was supposed to get rid of autoload. How long ago? Years? And yet it persists, and it's improved. Site work is filling the role of an autoloader for a dynamic Rails application that demands a little bit more of autoloading. Autoloading in the Ruby sense is saying, I want this constant to come from this file. In the Rails sense, we not only want the constant to come from its known location, but we also want it to be reloadable. And that's something that was difficult to do with Ruby autoloading. This is controversial. 
is auto loading a good thing? Is it a bad thing? In the application domain, we think it's clearly a good thing. It's the expectation that when you're within the boundary of your application, when you reference a constant, when you reference a domain object, you expect it to exist. You don't expect to do careful management and module imports because Ruby doesn't have a module system. So from the application for the application developer, auto-loading, which we call magic, it just seems like nature. That's the way that Ruby works. That's the way that your applications work. To a library developer or to somebody who isn't working in an application domain, it's magic. And maybe sometimes black magic and not so welcome. To me, the distinction here is that there are boundaries. With libraries, there are explicit dependencies. You want to state those dependencies, and it's important to do so. Within an application, the dependencies are implicit. Everything within your app is fair game, and you expect to reference it at any time. So uh, we can also admit that Ruby require is pretty leaky. We're not importing into an isolated namespace where you have side effects. So quick look at the way Zeitwerk works. Active Sword Dependencies has traditionally relied on module const missing, and kernel autoload is, presents some challenges to use. And in fact, there's an old statement in a Rails guide about dependency loading that lays out why it's difficult to use. It's a static declaration. It used to use an internal require. It's hard to manage reloading. Uh, it's tough to detect when a new file shows up or a new constant is defined. Where would you ever find it? And it's hard to nest all the loads. This is kind of a, a tricky one. Comps missing has its own issues. Constant resolution leads to developer confusion because we can't detect the namespace that uh, a constant is referenced within, whether it's the lexical namespace may be the top level or it may be nested within a module. And so we see at the bottom here, module A masks an A auto load. A does A, B, A colon B colon C reference C or A, C? It's a mess. It's the kind of thing where we can make something that feels kind of nice, but it has all kinds of holes in it. And as long as everybody learns that system, it kind of works until it doesn't. And then it's a big surprise. We're not happy about that. So it's 2019 now, though, and so let's take another look at our load. Maybe we can reconsider. So static declaration, sure. Internal require, that's gone. Now it uses normal Ruby require, which means that we can track the things that have been loaded, which is critical for reloading. <coughs> Difficult to reload? Well, we can remove the constant, and then we can reapply the auto load. Difficult to detect new constants, we can walk the file path because we have a conventional layout. And difficult to nest auto loads, we can track it because we have a trace point. <laughs> and I'm sure this is going to be a favorite feature of using trace point <laughs> in live Rails applications. And we look for the class event so we can detect when a class has been created. So finally, we get access to understand what Ruby is doing rather than trying to infer what it's doing from the const missing hook. Instead, Ruby tells us exactly what it's doing. And here, this is a little bit of pseudocode. It's essentially saying, look for the places where classes exist, and if I found that class named, then send it to the loader and tell me what happened. There's one little bonus here. We remove the trace point if we don't need it anymore. So if all the known constants have been loaded, then we remove the trace point and it's not live in the application any further. So there are some caveats, as with everything. It doesn't quite work for everything, but it's far, far better. We can work around this, and this is really a great result compared to const missing. So Siteverk site is a big improvement for active support dependencies and for your development applications. It comes with a little bit of bonuses, where if you've ever wondered about what's happening with auto-loading, now there's verbose output. 
So you can both troubleshoot and you can educate yourself. I found it really interesting to turn on the logger just to see what's occurring because it's also a view into the internals of Ruby, what Ruby's doing as it references a constant, as it decides what to load, and follows the whole chain until you get your class or your module loaded. Uh, one note, another caveat, is that bootsnap, which is also a favorite feature, uh, can interfere with this because bootsnap links, uh, reaches into require internals and tries to modify loaded features and load paths to help speed up boot. And so that interferes with the things that site tries to do. It's a really cool library too, it's just awesome code to read. So if you're interested in having a dive into something that's a fairly simple but neat addition to the way Ruby works, you can also use it in other libraries. Okay, let's go. Parallel tests, another big one. This comes from GitHub. Um, one of their cont contributions to Rails 6 is taking a broad look at what it means to be scalable by default. And that can cover a lot of things. In this case, it's what our development environment looks like. Are we waiting on a single core? It's modern times. Do we really need to be waiting on one core? This is a cool feature because it's so simple from the application's point of view. So it's something that's neat for people who are interested in technically how this kind of thing would work, but in a new application, it's just on. There's nothing else to do, there's nothing visible to you, so it's actually kind of boring, and boring in the best kind of way. It just makes it faster. This spins up, this is in a default test helper now. You get the number of processors on your computer, you get that many test processes. You namespace the resources you use, so they're all suffixed, and you have the opportunity to hook in yourself. So if you're using Redis, or if you're using any other kind of resource in your application, you'll need to do a similar kind of suffix or namespace. So there's an example here of namespacing Redis so that everybody can use the same one and they won't conflict. Similarly, with continuous integration, you might want to say, don't use all my CPU because I've got four runners on the same box, so limit the number of CPUs rather than using them all. The next big one is multiple database support. This one's been important to us at Basecamp because we've been using multiple databases for years and we've failed to contribute the changes. So we have some libraries that have Rails 2 code, Rails 3 code, Rails 4 code, Rails 5 code, and Rails 6 code, all to manage multiple databases and migrations and schema and all that. It's not pretty. I'm very glad we have multiple database support now. This goes along with GitHub's effort to be scalable by default. In their own applications, they talk to multiple databases, and they've extracted a nice simple API. In your model, you can declare that you connect to a database, you give a role name and a database configuration name. So it adds an additional tier to your database configuration. Environment, role, configuration. So you can state which database you'd like to use based on the logical function that it serves in your application. Whether you're scaling out or scaling up, whether you're partitioning data, whether you're replicating data, you can represent it with a role, so it gives you a lot of flexibility for how you set up and deploy your application. And similarly, that block form connected to role is saying, I want to be connected to that role, and I'm going to do work on that database within the block. That sounds like a lot of paperwork though. Are you gonna say that I'm connected to a specific database every time? Well, so here's an example of partitioning data. You want to store something that's large in another database, but you wanna keep it in your main app. And so you say that I connect to that database, it's my primary for writes, and then I scale out reads. Okay, fine, pretty simple. This is the scale out case. I just put it on a different host. This is the partition case where I've got a whole separate database for events. Notice the very end here, migrations path. Your migrations are stored in a separate directory so you get independent database versioning and upgrades. They're tracked separately and coherently. Similarly, you get your own break tasks and the rake tests are suffixed with the role name. So you can migrate your events database separately from your primary database. 
One nice little trick that I haven't seen that much is that there's now an internal method uh, to prevent writes. So this is just kind of uh, guardrails that you can use in your app as well. Now, this is a lot of paperwork unless you have something do it automatically for you. So what we'd like to see for replication cases is gets and head requests to hit the replica and for all other requests that could mutate the database automatically go to the primary. And there's a nice middleware that sets this up for us. It's the resolver middleware. It tracks the current role that your application points to in the session. And the delay there of two seconds is to account for replication lag. So after you write, you stick to the primary database for two seconds, accounting for going back to the replica and getting a current read. So you can use this for all kinds of stuff. Cross-region replication, disaster recovery, high availability, or just simply to scale out within a single deployment. All right. Those are the kind of highlight features, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up because we haven't even talked about Action Text or Action Mailbox. Action Text, framework for getting started with rich text without days of work. This is something as I see that the way that you integrate Action Text with an application makes it feel like it's a feature of the web that should have been available to applications all along. The fact that this is something that we had to build by hand feels weird because when you see the actual integration, it's just like using a select box or any other kind of text field. Interesting thing with Action Text, the notable thing is that it's a full stack integration. Client side JavaScript, controllers, models, storage, and it builds on other Rails components. Action Mailbox is in the same boat. It builds on other components. It comes from the days of using Action Mailer.receive with nothing on the end. You just got received, and then you're responsible for the rest. This is this fills in what that rest is. Relies on active record, active job for processing, and active storage to store the emails in route. Now, are these frameworks? Your app participates in providing mailboxes, in using action text features but it feels an awful lot like they're a little bit more than a library that you use, or a framework in the traditional sense. And we'll talk about this more in a bit. The other major feature of Rails 6 are all the small things that people have contributed. As I said before, it's, I think of them as pearls. You've encountered an irritation, and you wrap around it, hopefully with something that turns into something beautiful, something you can share and that you're proud of and you admire. And all of us contribute these. These are the main kind of pull request, all bug fixes in there too. Rails 6 development started just over a year ago and we have 769 contributors in that time. And that's actually, I checked yesterday and it was 770 and then I I checked this morning and it was 771. <laughs> in that time, that's 6,423 commits. And that's from everybody worldwide fixing issues they discovered in their apps. That's making improvements that their apps revealed to us and things they chose to share. And tons of these are first time committers. Thankfully, GitHub now reveals this on pull requests. So you can see that it's somebody's very first effort contributing to Rails. We give that special attention and love to encourage it. It's a classic long tail too. Every person contributing a little bit adds up to a lot, but you know, a few people contributing a lot also adds up to a lot. This is the Rails contributors to Rails Edge. So you can see Camipo there. <laughs> Camipo is basically active record maintainer these days. So. Commit bits in Japan, Matsuda, Mipo, Ayagi. We have deep appreciation for people who take this role on and trust that they shepherd in most of these commits. It's in review of pull requests and understanding what matters to Rails and understanding what matters to application authors that it takes a lot of empathy to be able to say no to a pull request and to say yes and understand how to get it into Rails. All right. 
Back to some of the pearls. I'd like to walk through quickly some of the some neat ones. Let's start with security. Classic one, DNS rebinding. My evil site goes to your app's IP address. Oh, your app now generates a link with the wrong host. So it generates a password reset URL with the evil site. And now that site rebinds its DNS to its own address. And you've just been fished. Now, this is a classic attack, and other frameworks have dealt with it for years, and Rails is finally saying we should do it. Allowed hosts is a middleware that box hosts based on regular expressions or based on strings or anything that really that, uh, I don't know how to say, the case equals, three equals. So this is what it looks like in development. It's wide open. It says anybody in localhost or anybody in the world can use this. I do not recommend this. Uh, this in development is the time to mimic your production environment as closely as possible. An example in production, you give your own host and you can provide a regular expression to match any host you like. So you can use regular expressions, prox, IP address, your object. There's one shortcut where you can use a subdomain that says match everything. Another security one, cookies have a purpose. Cookie replays are a problem. Let's take a look at what that plays out like. I've assigned cookie, say it's my favorite number. I also have assigned cookie that's my user ID. If I assign my favorite number to my user ID, will I detect it? Well, what will that equal? Well, it turns out that it'll equal my favorite number because they're assigned with the same secret. So I can replay a cookie. There's a new feature that adds cookies with metadata, which includes a purpose, which in, for encrypted or signed cookies includes the purpose, and if you try to reassign the purpose to a different cookie, you'll get no. It will disallow replay. So I recommend checking that out. It's not on by default, which it should be, but it's backward incompatible. So it needs your attention. Object allocations, this is Aaron and Eileen on the case. Now all your render calls also indicate how many objects were allocated. Good visibility matches productions often when timing doesn't because it shows the work done. More instrumentation, every event now includes CPU time, idle time, and allocations. So you get thorough performance instrumentation which then you can report elsewhere. We get more events. Active job now participates in active support notifications. So you can send specific event notifications to Prometheus or to StatsD to track what your application is doing. Now we've got a lot of little ones that I'm going to go through quickly because I thought these were cool, but we're running out of time. Following redirects, capturing exceptions. These are all things that specific people ran into because their Rails apps couldn't do them, and you won't see them in a guide because they're tiny additions. Image processing, switching to libvips. Uh, it's actually not the default, but this is an awesome library to check into. Fast image processing. If you've ever used image magic, um, you should probably be looking at vips. <laughs> Action Cable also joins the program in getting CoffeeScript out and ECMAScript in. We get new test helpers, you can assert what was broadcast, you can subscribe, and you can assert what was streamed, you can check transmissions just like you can check mail deliveries. Tiny thing, if you've ever tried to bite slice, well, graphene clusters are going to get split up. This was my tiny pearl because I committed a bug where we pushed we sent out push notifications that are byte limited, and when you split a, a split a graphene cluster, it's not invalid UTF-8, but it's invalid to the human mind because you've just divided a family. <laughs> and so now you can truncate bytes and preserve graphene clusters. We have credentials for every environment, so no longer do we have access control all mixed together. Production is in a, has a separate key. You can change your database. When you say, I've got a new application, 
Well, it's SQLite. You forgot. <laughs> well, <laughs> now it's fixed. Tiny thing, tiny things. Sessions aren't hashes, but we love hash dig. Well, we'd like to use hash dig on sessions, so now you can. A bug. <laughs> This has been wrong for ages, and it was just fixed. What? We would garble these file names depending on your user agent and depending on a proxy, and now they're properly encoded. Pick. We had pluck, and now we have pick. So if you know what a pluck or a pick is, I'm not sure the difference between a pluck and a pick. But in active record, a pluck is multiple things, and a pick is just one thing. <laughs> One caveat, pick is not ordered by default, so you need to pay attention that you're getting the first thing. Create or find by flips, find or create by. If you feel like you just learned find or create by, now to learn the other one. Create or find by avoids a race condition with stale reads and introduces a different kind of race condition with concurrent deletes, but they're much less likely to happen. We gain fast insertions and upserts. So, other gems have provided this, and now it's in Rails proper. So you can see that we ignore conflicts in the insert all case, and we update in the upsert case. We just got annotations. This is something that's in a marginalia gem. You can comment on a SQL query so that you can correlate it with what your application did. So you can include things like a request ID, a trace ID, a span ID, or just a comment that you really don't like that query. Optimizer hints also just arrived. So if you've ever wanted to limit a query time, or if you want to be specific about an index merge or join strategy, you can do it. Lazy transactions. Begin commit, begin commit, begin commit. <laughs> Those are gone. That sheds a lot of database load, and it's for free. More small ones, finding your own pearls. We have a year format option. Tiny thing, where somebody monkey patched and maintained it and then decided to share with Rails. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so these are all small things that grew into big contributions. We see this again and again. Another one, errors kind of. You wouldn't see this until you come across it in somebody else's code. This is the kind of thing that makes your tests a little bit nicer because you can ask if there's a name error or you can ask if there's a name with a certain kind of message error. And in classic form, replanting seeds. Can you guess who contributed this? This is all it does. Loads the configuration, deletes your tables, and runs seed again. And that comes from DHH. <laughs> but why do I need to do this? Is this bringing a smile to my face? Having to remove my database, then run seed again? I want to replant my seeds. I need a task for that. <laughs> so again, our pearls. Now let's go back to frameworks. Are they frameworks? We had our first test with this with active storage, and this was a risk for us. We're adding broad new things to Rails applications. Is it going to work? This came in Rails 5.2. You can declare attached files to your models, show image previews, it's full stack, JavaScript, controllers, models, jobs. The thing to recognize is that it compresses a complex system to simplify your application domain. This is our guide star for Will this make sense as a framework for Rails? Is it in the user's face? Is it interfering with your application? Or is it supporting your application? Going back to being a one-stop shop. We call it a framework, but really Rails is more. It's an information system that you build on. See, our application domain is simplified by compressing the complex information system. In the case of active storage, we want as many attached in our application. And really, there's a whole object storage system beneath. It's built on a complex system. Action Cable did the same thing in Rails 5. We got live web, web updates on the application side, and we have a complex system beneath. Again, we took a rail tie, and we turned it into an engine, and said, this can work in Rails. Action Text takes the same approach. 
it builds on, it allows Rails to build on itself. Rich text should be there for everybody. We started as a science project in Basecamp. We call a science project because it takes long-term work and effort. We bound it up with tricks, another long-term science project. This is something that you will be able to plug in. We started with tricks because it co it's cohesive and coherent with the rest, rest of action text, but you'll be able to plug in any other WYSIWYG rich text editor you like. These are the basics. This is where we see why wasn't this part of the web in the first place? Because there's no work that you're doing. You're saying, I want a rich text comment, I add a form for it, and then there's nothing special you do. It just works. That's it. And you say, but this is our job. Shouldn't we be implementing all of this? Like, should we? Should we implement all of it? Do we want to become these? <laughs> we aren't content management systems. We are a web development framework. We're focused on making web applications. App domain over information system in action text. We want rich user input, and it's a whole text editing system underneath. We've compressed a complex system into something that's simple for your application domain. Action Mailbox is in the same boat. We want to receive email without days of work. This is the missing stack behind Action Mailer Receive. Also started as a science project. We've implemented, implemented it for every application dozens of times, and that's enough times to implement it. We kept reusing and reintegrating our efforts. We extracted from Basecamp into an Action Mailbox framework, and then we brought the Action Mailbox framework back into Basecamp to prove that it works as well as we hope. Manages the whole pipeline, ingress, storage, and queuing, processing, routing, and we can see it builds on other Rails frameworks. This is paying off for us. It's as simple as installing it, setting up your ingress, a relay covers your own mail server, whether that's Postfix, XM, QMail, or any other, you provide the mail transfer agent, or you can bring a mail transfer agent with you. These are all built in to Action Mailbox, so you can start with them right away. Same simple Rails pattern, generate the mailbox, and implement a process method. You get filters, just like before action, you have before processing. You can act on the mail, by creating a comment. This is a look at our actual routing in Basecamp 3. We define routing based on regular expressions on addresses and send them along to the appropriate mailbox. An example of a more complex mailbox where we've delegated most of the actual processing to a separate class. And an example of a mailbox where we're interacting via email in the if condition here, we are recording something in the database, and that's it. In the else condition, we didn't get enough information, so we're actually sending an email back to the person who wrote us to ask for more information. Incineration is new. We hang on to emails for 30 days for retention, troubleshooting, reprocessing, and an audit trail. And you can set that to nil if you need to hold on to them. This is our first look at the conductor, too. Action Mailbox introduces a way to see the emails that you're processing and to send new emails in development. Same story with tests. Very simple, you have a test case, and you can receive an inbound email from mail, from a string source, or from a file, and then you can make assertions about what happened. Again, application domain simple, information system complex. We have app mailboxes on top of a mail ingress and processing pipeline. And good old action mailer base receive is going away. It was deprecated in Rails 6 beta 1. So to understand what's going on with these two new frameworks, we need to understand what's old in Rails. But these really aren't new. They're an expression of years of experience and discovery across generations of apps. We, they're new to Rails, but they're not births. They're graduations. We arrived here by following the Rails doctrine. Let's state the same about Rails. Every aspect of Rails reflects these things. In this sense, Rails is more than a framework or a specific software version. It's our vision of the future of the web and how we build applications. We're banking on that credibility. We're running the same playbook we have with every version of Rails. We're guided by these same principles. 
So what's old about Rails 6 and what will be old about Rails 7 and old about Rails 10 are the things that continue to be true about Rails. <coughs> and these are the things we share with you. They reflect the trust and principles that we share together and that you can expect us to continue to exhibit through the years as we develop Rails. These things will stay true. We're at home on the web. <coughs> We're at home with Ruby. We're at home with our Rails doctrine and we have something to build. These things will not change for us. So these are the things you can count on from Rails. Okay, okay, we share the values, we use the web, we write code, okay, we got it. So at this point, you can roll our eyes. And, but why these specifically? It's because we needed them. We're working on a new project and we're having to copy paste things from other applications and it seemed like it was too long. We needed them again and again and again. And now we're ready. Active Storage proved that we can do this and that it works. So we're confident and we're gonna be looking for more opportunities like this. So back to what's new. Rails reflects our history of building software for the web with a small team of software writers and building applications that make us smile. All the additions to Rails 6 reflect this. The conductor mentioned before, this is tiny. So there's not much there now, but it's the basics, it's a seed. It's long desired and we're finally actually doing it. If you go to rails slash rails slash conductor, you can see it's basically like a little stub. This is something for us to grow on. We're linking old things, we're adding new things, inbound emails, the things that you see in the command line interface, source notes. This is a home for us. It's basic, but it's our home and we can all extend it with plugins and engines. So you can add things to the conductor for new people to use. And I've got discussion of Rails 7 here, but I'm over time, so. you'd like to talk about Rails 7? Yeah, I've got I've got too much content here. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes like more than like ten or twenty minutes. Okay, uh, I will I will I will be I'll be quick because this isn't about specific plans for Rails seven. It's about what's important to me about Rails and Rails six, and what will continue to be important for me. When I talked about pearls, it's places that I come in contact with programming problems, things I don't know how to solve, things that give me anxiety about what am I going to do. And these are things I want Rails to help me solve. So when I look at what's new in Rails 7, <laughs> I look at what's old in Rails 7. Sorry. <laughs> and it's those pearls. The things that I come back to, things like DevOps. What kind of, how can Rails help with DevOps? When I look at the application domain and the information system underneath, what can I compress? What can I simplify for applications? We're both software writers and system builders. We need to take responsibility for the information system and for the application we create. When I see this, Docker, Kubernetes, orchestration, cloud, mesh, that's me. <laughs> Docker in development, terrible. It's so slow. It's funky. Why, why is it this way? Why can't we make it better? We tolerate a lot and we don't need to be so tolerant of things that affect our quality of life. So we can try other things. We could point something like Spring at Docker, get rid of the process model, make it a proxy, allow it to talk to a web API. The future is wide open for things like this. Observability also. <laughs> I don't know what this means. Everybody says observability is a thing. I thought we were still doing monitoring. Observability, because devs don't like to do monitoring. We need to package it up in new nomenclature to make it palatable and trendy. Well, maybe monitoring, alerting, tracing, distributed systems. What does Rails have to say about these things? Logs, metrics, traces, an event stream. Products do this for us, vendors do this for us. What can we do? We have active support notifications. This is just an event stream. What can we build from that event stream? We've got a bunch of vendor specific tools that hook into this and do their own monkey patching rather than contributing back to the event stream. Should we be looking to open things? Open tracing, open census, open metrics. Everything is open, 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 open. <laughs> Why are you closed when people say open? <laughs> the 
the best I could see is open census. It's just a, it's a thin wrapper saying, this is how you talk to me. I don't know. It's just any metrics backend, tracing backend. Application resilience. Users can't notice your app is awesome if your app is down. How does Rails help keep your app up? I think this is some place where monoliths can learn from microservices, or microservices have traveled a hard road and they've invited error conditions into their applications. Monoliths can benefit from the knowledge that microservices have gained. Of course, now you have two problems. But microservices gained the, gained the benefits that match the costs that they've incurred. We can learn from immutable infrastructure, deploying things with Docker. What does back pressure in a Rails application look like? Or circuit breakers? Going back to responsibility for both. We're software writers, we can focus on the application domain, but we're also responsible for the system that we build and everything that implies. I'm gonna go quickly through. Privacy is something that's important to all of us. We see new legislation, we're recognizing that we are behind. These are things that we need to be able to guarantee users of all of our applications, and we don't have that many answers. These should be standard. This is something that programmers need to grapple with. What does it look like, our ethical responsibility to do the right thing versus just being satisfied with the technically correct thing? Matching the legislation and the letter of, letter of the law versus looking out for people. So these are things we could do. We could encrypt attributes, we could encrypt files, we could provide key rotation and management, we could allow you to do that per account, we could allow you to do that per user, and these are things that people have to build themselves today. So we'd like to see privacy by design, no links to third parties, ideas of tainting private data so that it can't get into a log stream. Should we anonymize IP addresses by default? These are the places where Rails can make strong stands on can use the power of strong defaults to say this is how information sharing and personal data privacy should look like. So privacy by design, privacy by default. And finally, the things I see being new in Rails 7 are your experiences, your apps, your pearls. The things that you admire, you need to share with all of us. And you know who you can talk to to get them into Rails. So back to Rails 7, we're a one-stop shop to build the apps we need. Users don't care about our frameworks, our favorite Ruby gems, our CI pipeline, our blue-green deploys. They don't care that we use Ruby or MVC or Kubernetes or Webpacker or that we write clean code. Remember, the application domain is separate from the information system. Users do care if it's a great place to go on the web. Is it simple? Is it fast? Is it resilient? Let's get the basics right. This is what users see. So what's new in Rails 7 is what's new in Rails 10. <laughs> and it's what's new in Rails 6. And it's what's true for Rails. Focusing our app on our app domain, what matters to our business, and answering our users' basic demands, simple, fast, resilient apps that bring a smile to our faces. So thank you. So can can Oppo be a 
um, alternative to like JavaScript in the future? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really cool. And it's it's something that we run into, like David alluded to, with being able to choose your own language on the on the server side, but you can't really choose your language so much on the client side. You compile to JavaScript, you compile to web. I've never said that out loud. ASM? ASM? <laughs> you, compile, you compile to the web. And so using something like Opal compiling to the web, it's a different kind of situation than having the freedom to do whatever you like on the server side. I would love to use Ruby on the web, too. <laughs> I, here's one question. Uh, so can we use action text even when we don't use action view, for example, SP app? Like separate API, Rails API and React or whatever. Yes, we we use Action Text in our native apps for Basecamp three. Through through API mode. Not through API mode, but when we expose. Hmm. Yeah, what would the other end of the API be? It's where, where the rich text editor lives would need to be someplace else. So if you're using action view to provide the rich text editor. So for example, we can build our own rich text editor in React app. Yes. They, it, it can connect to uh, so there's, Rails backend. Yes, I understand. There's a, there is a pull request now to uh, perhaps it's not the pull request stage. It may just be an issue, which is the, the issue is tricks only. And tricks is something that's bound to the action view and a web form. So if you want to provide a native formatted text editor, like using a native view or using RTF instead of HTML, that's totally possible. But you need to help implement it. So it's not implemented yet, but... No. まだ無理そう無理だそうです。<笑>あのあえっと質問としてはこれ API モードとかの時に何かアクションテキストを使えるのみたいな話です。ね、あそうですね。なんで回答はその機能が欲しかったらコード自分で書いてください。プレクエストお待ちしてますという。<笑>あ,あのなんでその機能欲しい人はぜひプレクエストください実装してくださいとのことです。<笑> Thank you.、Uh, So, the、uh, final question is what is the most important thing to do? Thanks for the great introduction to Rails 6. So, my question is a little bit about Conductor and I guess the motivations behind that. I know that a lot of product teams which build Rails applications have a customer facing portion and an internal facing portion. With Conductor, is, your intent to,、uh, is the intent of the Rails team to accommodate the developer or also try to accommodate the internal staff facing portions of the application as well? There are we dragons. Yeah, expanding from something that's meant for developers and meant kind of like a developer console, analogous to what you'd use the Rails command for, is interesting but also dangerous territory. And、uh, if we turn it into an admin view like Django or、uh, another gem that would provide that kind of view, then it starts seeming kind of odd. What is the role? Do we feel confident in it? Have we used it before? At Basecamp, we haven't. We, we don't have the experience with the need and the necessity. To feel like this is something that we can confidently say is going to be right for other people because we're not sure it's right for us. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much.